your merciful forgiveness and our worship for your majestic glory. May the busyness of our life and the cares of this world be stilled by your presence of the Holy Spirit as together we bring glory to your name through Jesus Christ in whom we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us those trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Testament reading this morning is from Luke chapter 12, <coughs> beginning at verse 15. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for man's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And the Lord said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. And then skip over to verse 31. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. May the Lord add his blessing to the word we've shared this morning. A few years ago, my wife and I bought this beautiful log home on a more or less secluded lake in southern New Hampshire. The water is clear as a bell, kind of like Lake Winnipesaukee. The home has a wraparound screened-in porch with an all-season sunroom, <clears throat> five bedrooms, plenty of room for all the grandchildren to come and visit. And because we are environmentally responsible. Uh, the house is both heated and cooled by a geothermal system. So uh, we plan to move there in a couple of years. But in the meantime, uh, we are upgrading our present home to fit our current living standards. We'll have an enclosed in-ground heated pool for those icy winter days. And we're adding a large family room with a 200-inch TV so we can watch the Patriots try to squirm out of last place. <laughs> and there's also a four-bay garage 
uh, that'll ho house my antique fire truck and a couple of boats. All this you want to stand on a retired pastor's pension. <laughs> but you know, you might as well enjoy the best while you have the chance, before arthritis gets the best of me, you know. What? <laughs> Lloyd, I hear you people in the back row whispering. The, this guy is full of baloney. Well, you're right. That was a fanciful story. But only because one of Jesus' stories got me to thinking. Uh, what did he really mean when he said, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven? Um, what kind of currency exchange is going on in heaven? And are there any ATM machines there? No. Uh, and when Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you in my father's house where there are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. Uh, what kind of place is that exactly? And if that's the case, then what are we to think about the tents that we are living in now on our way to the promised land? Um, well, Jesus told a story that shed some light on this. Uh, <clears throat> in Luke chapter 16, he talks about this, this wealthy gentleman uh, relaxing in his fancy home, wearing the finest of designer clothes by Hart, Schaffner, and Marx. Are they still in business? I don't even know. <laughs> uh, his servants are busy in the kitchen preparing this lovely roast beef dinner with Yorkshire pudding, pan-fried potatoes and gravy, uh, fresh loaves of French bread, a pitcher of sweet iced tea. I think this guy's from the South. I'm getting hungry already, and it's only 10.30. Uh, but wait. There seems to be some homeless gentleman sitting on the front porch, obviously grievously ill, just asking for some scraps from the leftovers from dinner. In the story that Jesus told, he's given a name. His name is Lazarus. And he seems to come by every day begging until the servants can get him to move on, out of sight, out of mind. Well, listen to the story as, as Jesus tells it. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 16, and I'll, I'll read it for you. And, and it goes this way. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. Uh, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. But in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to there cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Oh. This is not a feel-good story, I must confess. But this man has been so busy with his fancy food and his fancy house 
and his fancy servants that he forgot to plan for what is on the other side of life, of which Jesus spoke so eloquently. Uh, he, he forgot that both he and his treasure uh, can abruptly come to an end. He apparently didn't pay too much attention to those beautiful words of Isaiah the prophet, uh, who wrote uh, in chapter 55 uh, these, these beautiful words when I find them. <clears throat> I say 55, verse 2. Why spend money on that which is not bread, and your labor on that which does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and reach for that which is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Those words apparently had escaped his attention. So the end of the story, as we read, is quite unsettling. As death comes, the man without his wealth is seen to be in hell. No fancy clothes, no roast beef dinner, only torment. The torment of what could have been. If only. He had opened his heart and learned the spirit behind that ancient Israeli feast called the Feast of First Fruits. If only he could see that maybe he and all his stuff might have had a higher purpose. The Feast of First Fruits is an Old Testament uh, feast that you read about in, in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, let me read that for you. Uh, Deuteronomy 26, and it goes like this, <clears throat> beginning at verse 1. When you have entered the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you, put them in a basket. And then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the one in office at the time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. And the priest shall take the basket from your hands, set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. And over verse, verse 11. And you, and those in the temple, and the strangers in your land, shall rejoice in all the good things that the Lord has given you and to your household. And say to the Lord your God, I have taken from my house a sacred portion and have given it to you to be shared with the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all that you have commanded me. Interesting. This was a feast celebrating the very first harvesting of the springtime fruit and crops. And it was a way of thanking and recognizing God for his provision of these new crops and for the confidence that there was more to come. It was a way of entering into a thanksgiving spirit, uh, thanking God for these very first fruits, and then sharing it with, quote, the strangers in the land. Hmm. It was to be a strong reminder of the historic Passover, which in a sense, God had given back to the Israelites their firstborn when the firstborn of all the Egyptian families, from Pharaoh down to the lowest servant, that awful night, lost their firstborn. What a grievous and serious and painful penalty that was for all their 400 years of inhuman treatment in slavery of the Israelites. So 
The first fruits was a reminder that mercy received from God should be recognized by returning a gift to him in thanks, returning the first cut, so to speak, out of gratitude to the Lord. The pattern was, and maybe if I could put it in words that God might say, uh, in gratitude for all my provision for you, bring me the first cut that I might share with others. And I'll see, it, I'll see to it that uh, you can live well on what is left. Hmm. Jesus put it this way, and as our sister so beautifully sang, uh, Matthew 16, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. <clears throat> I think it's, it's a pattern suggested even in the Lord's Prayer when we pray right in the middle of that prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Passing on the mercy. Jesus was so focused on this very nearsighted and dangerous tendency that we humans seem to have about focusing all of our energy on those treasures that seem presently in our hands that will soon disappear while ignoring the eternal things that could be shared with the strangers among us. So Jesus told another parable uh, that we read earlier and that is similar to this parable about the rich man with his fine food and his fancy clothes. Uh, it has all, that early story we read earlier has all the same symptoms of the story just spoken of. Uh, and uh, let, let me read it to you again in Luke chapter 12. especially the, the closing verse. Uh, the man said to himself, I have plenty of good things. I must well relax and take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, you're a fool. Because <laughs> this night, you and your money will be parted. <laughs> so verse, one, uh, verse 21 says, woe to those who store up things for themselves and neglect uh, the kingdom. But then the final verse says, seek first his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Woe to the ones who see value only in earthly things and fail to invest in that which is on the eternal side. It's so obvious to us that we live in a culture uh, that is all in on, on collecting all the earthly trinkets they can and all the things they can possibly store away and pretend that they and we will live forever. I have a friend who has a statement about uh, <clears throat> money. It says, Money talks. It says goodbye. <laughs> well, so our focus tends to get pushed by all those around us who want to focus on all the earthly things we can store in our barns and forget the words of Jesus when he said, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. I don't know whether you heard on the news the story about some of the Hamas leaders they apparently are living it up well in Qatar, staying in the finest of hotels. These guys are millionaires. Well, all the suffering goes on in Gaza. Uh, Jesus had it right. He identified <laughs> the life fools. In the meantime, 
we see that the Lord is desperately trying to get our attention on this business of laying up treasure in heaven. Thanksgiving season is a great reminder of that. When we are reminded with the old feast of the first fruits, that we're thankful that the Lord has provided so much and we have an opportunity to, to give back. Uh, that treasure that we are to lay up, lay up in heaven, I think is candidly described in Jesus' parable uh, in Matthew 25, the story about the sheep and the goats. Uh, it's good reading, and you should reread that. Uh, but in the first parable we spoke about this morning, Jesus seems to be laying on our doorsteps, courtesy of some rather strange political policies currently in effect, <clears throat> thousands and thousands of needy immigrants, probably a lot of terrorists too, but we'll ignore them, uh, some of these needy immigrants just looking for the table scraps to feed on, if you will. Now, that's something to think about. Uh, the fields are white unto harvest, the scripture says. The Lord has thrown open to us many doors of opportunity for mission, for reaching out into his kingdom. And uh, instead of filling more and more overstuffed barns, there are ministries of re outreach all around us that can capture our attention and our imagination. So, some of these uh, ministries doing the work of heaven are uh, indeed right next door, just up the road in Camp Sentinel, and where Pastor Kevin and the staff do us some wonderful, wonderful work up there with our young people and with our community all year round. Some of this outreach mission, outreach mission is as far away as the jungles of the South Pacific, where the translation of the scripture is progressing very, very well, uh, putting God's word in the hands of people who don't even have a written language. They've never heard of the love of Jesus. In fact, one of our Camp Sentinel graduates spent this past summer on one of those islands in the South Pacific among these folks. Uh, you may know, know her, Anna Mansfield from, uh, from Wolfboro. So these missions are going on. There's outreach everywhere. Uh, there is a mission of mercy just down the road in Ossipi to substance abusers. Uh, clients there uh, can receive not only help to escape their addiction, but a witness to the Jesus who can change their lives forever. In many of our local schools around here, LifeBridge Ministries is working with troubled teens, matching them with dedicated Christian mentors, showing them a different kind of life that will bring them joy, success, and hopefully salvation. God has even tossed into our laps these crazy red and green boxes. You may recognize them. They are uh, the work of uh, Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse, an opportunity to pack them up with some simple gifts, table scraps, if you will, uh, to send to neglected children all across the world. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> were shopping yesterday and are stuffing our boxes this afternoon. Uh, great opportunity for Christian witnesses. They carry with them not only some fun gifts, but the words of Scripture and of Jesus, who loves all the children. Jesus said, lift up your eyes, and you'll see that the harvest is out there just ready to be picked. Just need some laborers out there. Just need some boxes of stuff to go out where people are in need. So, I'm really not thinking about those imaginary mansions in the heated pools. <laughs> uh, these places that are always in need of some kind of repair and to which some well-meaning politician will levy a view tax. Oh well. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm reminded of the words when Jesus said, I has not seen, ear has not heard, 
nor has it entered into the imagination what great things God has prepared for those who love him. To be truthful, some of those imaginary mansions are really just a shabby substitute for that which God has prepared for those who love him, those who will dare to follow him into this dangerous world. I, I see on the television that uh, they tell us gold is a great investment. Well, it may be a great investment here, but in heaven they tell me it's only the pavement we walk on. <laughs> uh, I suppose if I were to try to define laying up treasures, it might sound like uh, to actively be showing our love for and our trust in our God so that we are willing to invest a significant part of our life and those treasures he gives us into the work of the kingdom as a kind of first fruits of thanksgiving to him for all that he has given us, knowing that his provision for us will never run out. So, pardon my fictitious story, <laughs> but let's lay up our treasures where they really belong. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Father, that you have placed us where we enjoy so many of the good things in life. And it's embarrassing at times to see how little, how little there is in the rest of this world. And yet how joyful are your children, wherever they may be found, who have learned that you love them and provide for them. So in this Thanksgiving season, continue to open our hearts to the joys of your kingdom, to the sharing of those things that you have so plentifully placed in our hand that we might demonstrate your love to others. For this grace, we ask your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is number 405. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Number 405.
invite you to uh, join us in fellowship downstairs following the service, but let us receive the benediction. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forevermore. Amen. May God bless you, each one, as we go our way into this world. Thank you.